in today's session, we're going to discuss some of the basics of tree identification. Um, really, whether you're talking about uh, trees in our own landscapes or communities, or landscaped areas, or trees in their natural environment, correct identification should always um, be the first thing. It should always precede any diagnosis or treatment or management when we're caring for those trees. Um, and to achieve accurate identification requires a combination of both knowledge and experience that come with a lot of practice. Once identification skills have been developed and you become more proficient, uh, you know, again, that comes from practice and repeated exposure to just getting out there and looking at different woody landscape plants at different times of the year. We are going to discuss many trees commonly found in Illinois. Um, so it's a good idea wherever you are located to find reference resources for the trees in your area. Um, so if you're joining us from another state, whether you're in Northern Illinois, Southern Illinois, you might find that there's some uh, variance in what you'll find locally. And keep in mind, uh, the big take home point for today is no matter which uh, reference materials or other guides you might use, a basic knowledge of botanical terminology and those principles is really crucial to accurate identification. And just as a side note, uh, that's not a typo, it is the nuts and bowls. A uh, bowl is a term for the main axis or stem or the trunk of a tree. So it wouldn't be one of my programs uh, or an extension program without a corny joke. So what are some of the nuts and bolts uh, or the very basics of tree ID? Um, here's some of the topics that we'll cover today. Uh, some how plants are classified and the scientific names given to them based on that classification system. We'll discuss some characteristics of plants and how they're used in tree identification. Um, leaf and branching arrangement and how that's used uh, to help identify. Some of the leaf shapes and types of leaf margins, bases, and apices or tips of the leaves. Um, and, you know, generally leaves are the easiest way to identify trees, but they aren't the only way to identify trees. Um, often closely related, trees can look quite similar, so we have to look at other characteristics like the bud and the twig uh, for really accurate ID. So the... The classifying of plants, the classification of plants is called plant taxonomy. This is um, classifying them, categorizing, naming them, and in those names, describing them. This isn't, um, you know, we have it for the, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, all living organisms are, are use classification system, um, but also sometimes for non-living things like fossils um, and different systems like Bloom's taxonomy that's used in education uh, to classify learning objectives. And really, unless you've had some sort of formal training, you'll often uh, use a key, a dichotomous key or a guide to identify trees based on their physical characteristics. Um, again, those are called dichotomous keys. They can be very, very helpful alongside of a bit of knowledge of this botanical terminology that we'll discuss. But before we even get to the keys, let's look at some of the other ways, some of the ways that trees are classified through taxonomy, and then discuss some of the even simpler ways to identify species of trees and shrubs. So why do we even classify plants or living things at all? Well, you know, as humans, um, it's really to make sense of our world, uh, to recognize exactly what species we're talking about. For instance, um, there can be many common names for one thing, uh, but only once there's only one scientific name. Um, 
or one name can, there can be a common name that applies to different species. So my example here on the, on the left, we have ficus elastica, often referred to as a rubber plant. Um, I have also heard this peperomia on the right referred to as a baby rubber plant. Um, though you might think, okay, they have really fat fleshy leaves. Uh, this variegated leaf here of the rubber plant on the left does look kind of similar to the peperomia, but in all actuality, they're in completely different plant families. The ficus um, on, the, on the left is in the mulberry family and the peperomia is in the pepper family. So being that uh, they're in different families, they're gonna have different flowering and fruiting structures. So entirely different, not all visual characteristics um, are gonna be our classifiers. And for the record, these, these two examples aren't necessarily plants we're going to find growing naturally in Illinois um, because they would not survive our winters here. Um, and as a side note from there, being able to survive the winter in a certain location is called zone hardiness. And that's what makes, um, you know, when you look at your, uh, that's what zone hardiness is what makes a plant considered an annual or perennial in your area. Often when you look at a plant tag, it will list a hardiness zone. Illinois is a pretty long state and includes several hardiness zones, as warm as I believe 7A in the southern tips of Illinois, up to 5A and maybe 4B in northern Illinois. Um, those have changed over time. Uh, in my county where I am in Macon County, we are now right where I live is on the line of 5B and 6A. That was not the case 20 years ago. Uh, so things are, there's a warming trend. So again, we can have a common name that, um, for instance, I hear both of these tree species called tulip tree. Um, I would call this one on the left a tulip poplar and the other one maybe a saucer magnolia. As you can see by the names, Liriodendron tulipifera. Um, that is an entirely different species than this magnolia. Um, but I will point out the tulipifera, you, see, you get kind of a descriptor in that specific epithet in that second part of the name there. Um, so just another reason that common names can be confusing. Again, there's only one scientific name for a particular species. And that scientific name is gonna be the same in every langu language and in every location in the world. So when we uh, talk about plant taxonomy, if you remember all the way back in, in fifth grade science class, you learned kingdom phylum class order family genus. Perhaps you learned species, but actually that last one is specific epithet. Um, and the species name is going to be a combination of your genus and your specific epithet. So you take these two, uh, classifications and put them together and that is your species name. So for example, sugar maple is genus Acer and specific epithet Saccharum. So the species name for sugar maple is Acer Saccharum. Um, that's the two names. So that's what we call binomial nomenclature, bi meaning two. Um, the genus, when you write them, the genus is always capitalized. The specific epithet is never capitalized and both are always italicized, not underlined, not bold uh, or anything like that. And you'll probably hear me talk a lot about the root words, um, oftentimes Latin, sometimes Greek. These are kind of the universal languages of science. Um, so we'll, we'll go through kind of each of these classifications uh, for the most part. So when we talk about, and these are just regular species of trees, when we start talking about cultivated plants, cultivated varieties of things or hybridized species, um, nomenclature gets a little bit more involved and we're not gonna delve too far into those rules. But we're talking about the plant kingdom, right? You probably would have guessed, not, not protozoa, not bacteria, not fungi, we are in kingdom plantae. So 
once we go a step below kingdom, we're into phylum. And this is where plants are classified into whether they flower or not. Our angiosperms are divided, um, are, are flowering plants. And uh, gymnosperms are our non-flowering plants. Um, we will talk about what these are further divided into momentarily, but um, angiosperms are flowering plants. These seeds are covered by an ovary. Okay, so um, you have, you know, our examples here, apples, nuts, wheat is, uh, is a fruit, essentially. Um, berries, uh, different kinds of, there's all kinds of different dry and fleshy fruits um, that will come from our flowering plants. And then gymnosperm, our non-flowering plants, um, include many conifers or cone-bearing trees, uh, also some other things like ginkgo. And the root words here, gymnosperm, uh, translates to naked seed because there's no covering on that seed. Um, so angiosperms are then further divided into two classes, dicotyledons and monocotyledons. Okay, so we've got kingdom, phylum, class. This is where our angiosperms um, are divided into monocots or dicots. And just to back up a little bit, the cotyledon is the seed leaf. It's the first leaf that appears out of the soil. So you can see here, we've got a monocot, mono meaning one. So there's one seed leaf uh, on the left and on the right, a dicot. It has two seed leaves and come in little pairs. Um, those are not the first true leaves. Those are seed leaves that um, come to be. So monocots will include things like grasses, uh, most palms, uh, corn is a monocot, uh, daffodils. Uh, there's some other things that you would be familiar with where uh, dicots are pretty much everything else uh, in the flowering uh, phylum. So then we go through, we kind of skipped over order. Order is really just closely related families grouped together. So we have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family. The family is, uh, plants are classified into families uh, by their flowering and fruiting structures. So um, we can have all kinds of things in the same family. There can be annual plants, perennials, uh, trees, vines, all anything like that, as long as it has that flower and fruiting structure, those are considered in the same family. So for instance, we have Fabaceae, our pea family, which is I think now subdivided into uh, further subfamilies, uh, but there are like 19,000 species in that family. Um, and all of them will have this pea-like flower and a legume, uh, the fruit, the little pod that we, we see. So here's a, an Ill, uh, or a photograph rather of black locust tree, uh, Robinia pseudoacacia. We see we have this pea-like flower, though it's several pea-like flowers in a whole in a cluster of flowers that we would call an inflorescence. And then the fruiting structure is this uh, leguminous pod. So that's a that's a woody tree that we see here in Illinois. Something uh, that would not survive our winters here and be considered an annual is our sweet pea. Um, again, we have the pea-like flower and the leguminous pod that many of us enjoy at dinner time. Um, and even some vines and undesirable species uh, fall into this, or in, undesirable in our area anyway. Um, so something like kudzu is actually included in the pea family. Again, we have the pea-like flower um, and this leguminous pod. So all kinds of things can fit into uh, a plant family, and those are the, the classifying characteristics. And we take a step down further below the family, we have the genus. So these are plants that are really closely related. Okay, so for instance, all oaks are in the genus Quercus. 
Uh, for instance, we have our northern red oak here, uh, Quercus rubra, rubra referring to red, um, and our white oak or Quercus alba. And I'll give you three guesses which city in America was named after Quercus alba. The first two don't count. You're welcome to put it in the chat. Um, but we have, at least on these oaks, um, a typical looking oak leaf, though red oaks will have pointy leaves, white oaks will have rounded leaves. Most oaks in Quercus are kind of divided into sub, uh, subgenus, whether they're kind of in the white group or the red group. Um, so that's just kind of a, a fun fact to know. Anything in the red group, uh, red oak group will have a pointy leaf, so much so that sometimes you'll even, you'll even see a little bristly hair on some of those points. Um, but they all have uh, the same types of flowers and they all have what we would recognize as the oak seed, also called an acorn. And, you know, just as a side note on oaks, there are a lot of oak species, of native oak species in Illinois, depending on what county you're in, what area in Illinois, you may have some and not others, but because so some of them are so similar looking, the leaves are similar looking, it can be hard to, to identify by leaves. Oftentimes the bud and the bark will be more helpful than leaves in identifying oaks. And then another example would be uh, maples. All of our maples fall into the genus Acer. So we have our silver maple, Acer saccharinum, um, and we have red maple, Acer rubrum, again, that rubrum referring to red. Um, we have flowers uh, that are very similar. And then we have the fruiting structure, everybody's favorite to clean out the gutters, right? Our silver maple has these, um, at my house, we call them helicopters. They're actually called Samaras. Um, silver maple has a single born Samara where red maple has a double Samara. And so it kind of varies from species to species of maple, uh, what that fruiting structure will look like exactly, but they will all be a Samara. So then when we get down to, we've gone through kingdom, phylum, class order, family, genus, we're down to the specific epithet. This is the descriptor. This is going to tell you something about the plant. Sometimes it can be um, a description about the appearance of the plant. So for instance, um, Populus deltoides, our Eastern cottonwood. Deltoides is in reference to the delta or triangle shaped leaf. Um, obviously the common name cottonwood, if you have one within a half a mile of your house, you probably know the seed dispersal method is by wind there, the cottony fluff that flies around. Um, again, the descriptor with something like Southern Magnolia or Magnolia grandiflora, grand meaning large or showy, uh, and flora meaning flower. So we have a big showy flower on our Southern Magnolia. The specific epithet can also um, tell you about the location of the plant, or at least where it was first noticed and observed and written down by whatever botanist discovered it in that location. So our Eastern red bud is Cercis canadensis. And if you can stretch your imagination, probably you can figure out that Canada is one of the places it was first um, recognized. Same with pecan. Uh, pecan is actually in the same genus as uh, our hickory trees. And again, I'll give you three guesses as to where they first found that. And the first two don't count, Caria illinoisensis. So that specific epithet can really tell you something about the plant. Um, and again, it's worth looking into those root words uh, that we'll, I'll give you a little more insight to. Certainly I don't, I don't know all of Latin or all of Greek, but there are some root words that really apply to our everyday English language and some of our other languages as well that like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. Dentate means uh, 
a toothed margin or so on. So uh, again, unless you have some really formal training of some sort, you're gonna probably use a guide or a key uh, to, to identify trees based on these physical characteristics. Um, let's look at what some of these characteristics can be. So woody plant identification is, uh, and I say woody, uh, that it would be opposed to herbaceous. Herbaceous plants are those that would quote unquote die back to the ground some of, uh, in the winter time. So some of our uh, native herbaceous perennials here in Illinois would be something like a coneflower or um, a rudbeckia, black-eyed Susan. There's nothing of that plant that remains, that really truly remains above ground. It, the living tissue is underneath and stems or uh, roots or rhizomes, um, sometimes are bulbs uh, like tulips and things. So those would be herbaceous. When I refer to woody, it's a, a, a skeleton essentially that it remains above ground to, over the winter. So woody plant identification is based on morphology. Morphology is the size, shape, and appearance of plant parts. And really kind of a fundamental knowledge of, um, to even a rudimentary knowledge of plant anatomy is going to be essential to try and recognize these plant parts and their characteristics, especially when using a key. Um, again, though we usually concentrate on the leaves um, when we're looking at trees and shrubs, Maybe we look at the form and say, oh, wow, that's a really big tree, or this is just a shrub. Um, classification is often based, again, on the reproductive structures like flower and fruit. Um, but you have to know a little bit more about it to use those identification keys. So, um, you know, if you only learn the leaves of a tree, when wintertime rolls around, you're not gonna do very good at identification, right? So then we look at some of the buds. Um, sometimes the stems or the twigs uh, can be an identifier. For instance, hickory trees have very, very stout twigs with big fat um, Hershey Kiss shaped buds where something like a hackberry tree has very fine branches and very small buds. Uh, the bark is going to vary from species to species. Uh, there are some things that look quite similar or you have to train your eyes on what you're looking for. But for instance, um, you know, the, uh, the bark of a cottonwood tree, of a mature cottonwood tree is really deeply fissured, these big chunky, what I imagine gold bars look like, uh, even though I'll never see one in my lifetime, um, but very identifiable characteristic can be the bark sometimes. Um, sorry, I have stems in there twice, I didn't see that. Again, the flowers can often be referred to in identification, but that only helps when the flowers are there, right? So if it's not time, it's not the season in which that tree flowers, that may not be the, the most helpful. Oftentimes fruit, uh, the fruit of the tree will be helpful. If you didn't know what this tree was and you looked down and saw an acorn on the ground, that probably would clue you into that it's likely an oak tree, right? Unless a, an acorn or several of them have been carried from somewhere else. Again, the form of a tree, um, can, can be uh, an identifying characteristic. Um, some, you know, a red bud, an Eastern red bud tree has a very familiar small vase shaped uh, multi-stemmed form. You're not gonna see many oak trees or maple trees grow like that, but uh, that can be another one. And then sometimes tree identification is more than just uh, relying on the visual senses. Sometimes the fragrance, um, or even the taste uh, of some things can be useful in determining those really unique characteristics of leaves or twigs or flowers or fruit. And those are just some little tricks that we can, um, that help us identify certain species. Again, once you learn to see trees as more than just the leaves, you can identify them uh, all year long. 
There are also a few simple ways to distinguish between the major groups of conifers or cone bearing trees. So for instance, pines have needles that are going to be born in fast little clusters. These little clusters are called fascicles. Um, pines will have needles born in fascicles of two, three, or five. So counting the needles can help to identify that species. Then after that, you're gonna, you know, there are several that have two needles born in fascicles of two. So you might have to dig a little deeper. Uh, I put Eastern white pine here because that's the only one that grows around here that I am aware of that has needles born in fascicles of five. So that's a pretty easy one uh, to identify. Um, our spruces and firs, uh, they produce their needles singly. Okay, so there's only one needle coming out. They're not in clusters. The needles of firs will detach from the stem and leave kind of a circular little pad where the uh, needles of a spruce tree will leave a little stalk. And that's a hard thing to describe over a webinar, but if you get used to, you know, you can go out and look at it, perhaps you'll see exactly uh, what I'm referring to. Then we have other conifers that may have a scale-like foliage or all-like, A-W-L uh, foliage. So our Eastern Red Cedar or Juniperus virginiana, one of our few uh, native evergreen species to Illinois, most parts, a lot of parts of Illinois. Um, they're not really needles, they're not really leaves, they're kind of something in between. So worth taking a, a closer look at. So again, to our dichotomous keys, these are tools that we use to systematically identify lots of different objects and organisms, but for our purposes today, to identify trees, right? And so we have a, a series of choices to make. It's kind of a step-by-step -step process. You'll get a question, um, you know, in some really simple dichotomous keys or, or uh, tree guides that may not include that many uh, species in it, the first question might be, do you live in the eastern half or the western half of the United States? If the eastern half, turn to this page. If the western half, turn to the such and such page. So they take you through and... Um, Again, it's a step-by-step step, step step method for unlocking the identity of a plant. As the more species that are included in a key, the more terminology you'll have to know, the more complex those uh, descriptions will be. Because the identification keys are going to use terminology that describe those morphological characteristics, the shape, the texture, the arrangement of the leaves, the bud characteristics, the twig shape, um, and the types of flowers and fruits. So we'll talk about a couple of commonly used botanical terms. Again, most keys will have maybe not always yes or no questions, but one or the other questions. The user, um, you would narrow down the possibilities by reviewing those visual characteristics of the plant in question. Um, and a really good key is gonna have clear and distinct options, okay? Um, a, again, a key is gonna become more complex to be able to separate or more technical between each step. Um, and those keys with more species will become a little more technical to use, may require some more technical knowledge. And you can, you can always purchase a book uh, of, uh, that's a glossary of botanical terminology to help you out with that. Um, so again, there are some drawbacks. You're gonna have to know a little bit about that botanical terminology, a certain, certain level of maybe not expertise, but understanding um, the terms is necessary. The plant being identified may not always match what's written exactly um, because you know seasonal differences, again, whether the flower is the distinctive characteristic of that plant, but it's not flowering right now, 
it's going to be difficult to identify. Um, so seasonal differences, um, morphology can certainly uh, change or vary based on location and environmental conditions. So if it's in a, if a water loving tree is in a place where it doesn't receive adequate water, it might appear a lot different than it's genetically supposed to. That's what we call the genotype and the phenotype. The genotype is what a species is genetically supposed to appear as. Uh, these are the genetic characteristics. And the phenotype is what it actually turns out looking like based on its environmental conditions. Um, and you know, another drawback to using keys um, is that you can get stuck. Um, if, you, if you aren't able to answer a question or you're not really sure what that terminology is in reference to, you can get stuck or you can get off track and get kind of down the rabbit hole, so to speak. So again, why terminology is, is really vital to using one. In handouts, uh, I have provided a, uh, a practice key. And as you can see, there's only 10 species, 10 drawings in here. So it's not a very long or large or intricate um, a dichotomous key, but it does give you an idea of how to use one if you have not before. And it's a kind of a fun little uh, practice session. I didn't necessarily plan on going through it with you, but you are more than welcome to, to use that handout on your own. And if you do have any questions, of course, you can contact myself or your local extension staff. So let's talk a little bit about uh, botanical terminology. Um, again, our root words are going to be really important when it comes to this. First, um, you know, whether it's a Latin term, a Greek term, uh, whichever base, some of these root words you're going to be familiar with already. Again, whether you speak English or bilingual or speak other languages, you're gonna recognize some of these. Um, for instance, uh, Quercus alba, as I mentioned, alba means white, okay? So white oak would be Quercus alba. Um, Aeschylus flava would be our yellow buckeye. So flava means yellow or flava, sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Um, let's see, uh, macro would, if anybody wants to guess, that's fine. Macro means large, just as micro would mean small, right? Macro phyla, so phyla means leaves, means with large leaves. Multiflora, multi means many. That's a, that's a term that, uh, a root word that we use in many terms. So some of these things are um, not going to say common sense, but they're recognizable. Um, we have a, uh, a pendulous plants sometimes, and it means hanging, hanging like a pendulum, uh, as if it were a pendulum. Whoops, excuse me. And uh, vernalis means of spring. So, for instance, our, our vernal witch hazel, like the vernal equinox, you can guess that would mean having to do with spring. To go on some of our leaf features. Um, these are things that many keys and manuals are going to, um, you'll have descriptors about. So first, whether the leaf is simple or compound. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means too. But for instance, this sycamore leaf is one whole leaf. That is the whole thing. That is one simple leaf. If you can imagine a, um, a black walnut leaf, that's a compound leaf. There's one axis with many leaflets on it. So we'll look at that here in a moment, but whether the leaf is simple or compound is gonna be one of your first dichotomies that, that takes you to one choice or the other. What the shape is, um, what the apex or tip looks like. Um, you know, what, what would somebody call the shape of this leaf? 
I don't know, overall maybe triangular with some large lobes, um, but it's kind of hard. And even when we do momentarily look at the shapes of leaves, there's a lot of crossover. We try and, and categorize things, but nature always shows us exceptions to those rules. Uh, the margin is simply the, the outside edge of that leaf. Um, the base, of course, is where is the base of the leaf, where uh, the petiole or stem comes out. Um, this would be a lobe sticking out here, and the sinus would be the notches out of uh, the leaf. The venation or veins can often be an identifying factor, or at least another descriptor about the tree. What color the leaves are, sometimes uh, some trees kind of have a more pale appearance or have a darker color on top than they do on bottom. Um, so that can be uh, an identifying characteristic as well as what the surface, both top and bottom surface feel like or appear to have. So some leaves, if you've ever uh, picked up a hackberry leaf, for instance, they're very hairy or uh, the term we would use is pubescent. They have lots of little hairs. It all, it's so hairy, it almost feels like sandpaper. So our leaf morphology is going to vary on, uh, depending on how old the plant is. Um, oftentimes our younger seedlings and saplings will have larger leaves than normal because they're trying to soak up as much sun to produce photosynthate as they can. Um, might depend on what the position of that leaf is in the crown. There's a difference between sun leaves and shade leaves. Um, so that would be, again, their light exposure. Um, and some plants hybridize within themselves. So uh, oaks are some that will um, hybridize white, white oaks with white oaks, red oaks with red oaks, and not always do their um, progeny uh, adhere to the genetic form or genotype. So um, when you're choosing a leaf for identif identification purposes, look for a more mature leaf with full sun exposure. So um, close to the end of the branch. So again, I, I mentioned our uh, types of leaves. A simple leaf would be, for instance, this red bud leaf. That is one whole leaf. That's all, all she wrote. Um, then we have different kinds of uh, compound leaves. So pinnately compound would be one main axis with leaflets coming off. It's only divided one time. A bipinnately compound leaf like this Kentucky coffee tree has one main axis and then axes dividing again. So it's divided twice and these leaflets uh, come out there. We also have things like our buckeye trees that are compound, palmately compound. So the leaves are all originating at this one point here, one point of origin. Our um, leaf arrangement is gonna be one of the first uh, first kind of steps in a key, uh, one of the first steps in, identific in identification, because it quickly eliminates several species. There's only a few um, really native trees to Illinois that are going to have opposite arrangement. Um, so that narrows it way down on things. Um, the way, again, the way leaves are arranged on the stem is going to be uh, very helpful in narrowing it down. So this is what I mean by opposite arrangement. These leaves are coming out opposite each other from the stem. Alternate would be one on one side and then it goes to the other side and so on. Sub opposite is just that, almost opposite, but not quite. And world is several coming out from the same uh, point of origin. So I mentioned that there's only a few trees in Illinois that, um, that are opposite leafing uh, arrangement. And oftentimes a mnemonic device for oppositely arranged native trees, for instance, um, 
would be Mad Horse Buck. So Mad is M-A-D, Maple Ash Dogwood. Horse is for Horse Chestnut and Buck for Buckeye. Um, horse Chestnut and Buckeye are pretty closely, closely related too. There are, now these are trees in Illinois. There are certainly some other large shrubs in other families that are opposite. And there may be trees native to other places in the US or in the world that are going to be exceptions to this rule. But for our purposes, we're talking about Illinois trees. Now, if you want to expand on that to more than just trees, oh, before I go on, not only will uh, oftentimes the leafing pattern be opposite, but sometimes when the leaves are not present, even the branching structure can be opposite. So this is an acer species. Uh, it's not a maple. Actually, it's a box elder, which is not a maple, but it's still in the acer genus. Um, but wanted to point out the branching structure on here is still very obviously opposite. So sometimes uh, that can help in winter identification, which is a real challenge. So another mnemonic device that more completely covers uh, oppositely arranged trees, some native, some introduced, um, uh, some we'll get into shrubs here in a moment, um, would be madcap hip fellow with the princess. So our mad is still our maple ash dogwood, though ash being in the Fraxinus genus, we also have in the same family, in the olive family, our forsythia, which is opposite, and syringa or lilac is also opposite. Because I know after I said mad buck, mad horse buck, you were like, wait a minute, I've got shrubs in my yard that are opposite. Well, if they're forsythia or lilac, may well be. Uh, again, our cornice, our dogwood. We've put buckeye and horse chestnut because they are in the same genus as their family name. So hippocastanaceae would be the hip. Amher cork tree is a non-native to Illinois, but we do see them occasionally. It can be common. Um, and so that would be phallodendron. And then princess tree, which is another introduced tree. Um, so that's where that comes in. So these are a list of mostly trees, but if we start talking about woody shrubs as well, we can add in the Caprifoliaceae family, uh, which includes the, uh, these genera or genuses. Um, so our honeysuckles, elderberry, viburnum, um, mostly recognized as shrubs, but still very common woody species uh, in Illinois. There are still yet other woody plants outside of the caprifoli, uh, woody shrubs, sorry, and trees outside of these families and genera. Uh, these are some other woody plants, um, mostly shrubs. Here, though we do have a few things, our fringe tree is recognized as a, as a small tree, small, may, maybe multi-stemmed tree sometimes. Um, Katsura is generally a tree. And I just wanted to point out here too about the um, scientific name of Katsura, uh, Circidophyllum. If you remember, our Eastern, Canada, uh, Eastern redbud is Circus canadensis. And if you'll notice the picture of this Katsura tree, the leaves look a lot like a redbud. So now that Circida phylum, Circus, you know, redbud looking leaf may make a little more sense too. When we go on and look at some of the leaf parts, we have talked about, uh, I showed you the lobe and the sinus, uh, the margin or edge of the leaf. The petiole is the stem. Um, on compound leaves, this is still the petiole, the part that attaches to the tree. But once we get up into the compound leaf part of it, this is actually called a rachis. Um, and a, a fun identifying fact with black walnut trees, for instance, is they will actually lose in the fall when they are uh, shedding their leaves, when they're losing their leaves. Um, 
the leaflets will actually fall off and many times the rachis will remain attached. So it looks like you have a bunch of little dead sticks hanging around in the tree, um, but just another identifying uh, factor there. And then on the leaflets on a compound leaf, these little tiny leaf stems aren't just petioles, they're petioles. So these are some terms, again, that may be used in those dichotomous keys. Um, we can also discuss leaf shape. Um, certainly there are some pretty, uh, these are not even all inclusive. This is not an exhaustive list of leaf shape. Um, most leaves are going to be a range of shapes, not necessarily one or another. So I pointed out that cottonwood leaf is a pretty uh, typical deltoid shape. It's kind of rounded at the edge too. So it could be deltoid chordate if you wanted to say. Um, references and guides, uh, your, your keys are going to give a range of shapes and it can sort of be subjective. It'll also vary uh, within the tree. So again, I gave you a hint on where to find the tree but look at several leaves to kind of narrow down a shape. So we have uh, obovate, which is both oblong and oval, right? Linear elliptical or lanceolate or oblanceolate. So there can be all kinds of different shapes. No person should ever be made to memorize all of these necessarily but just know that they exist. And so if you see a word in your key that you don't recognize, you're like, wow, that sounds kind of familiar. It's worth looking up because it's going to uh, give you some clue uh, for identification, some clues for identification. Whoa, really went fast there. Sorry about that. Um, going on here. The leaf apex or the tip of the leaf. So these are leaf tips or leaf apices. This is the terminal point of the leaf. And this can be helpful in differentiating between closely related species. Um, you may see, see some of these same terms when we discuss leaf bases here in a moment. So acuminate means that the sides curve up toward the apex. Acute. Uh, has an angle of less than 90 degrees uh, on the tip. Mucronate uh, would be kind of an, a, sh a short, abrupt point in the mid vein, along the mid vein. Uh, of course, there can be a rounded tip. Um, emarginate would mean it has a, a notch in the margin. So again, just different things to look for. Perhaps you didn't even realize that leaves could be so uh, intricately described. And again, our leaf bases. So um, sometimes auriculate can help us determine one oak from another, for instance. Chordate is, again, our heart shape. Um, our rounded is pretty uh, straightforward. An oblique base, you may think, well, gosh, most of the time, um, leaves are somewhat symmetrical, and oftentimes that can be true, but there are several species of trees. A hackberry comes to mind, um, along with other elms, that, because they're in the same family. Uh, our linden trees often have an oblique base, um, so kind of this uneven. Um, so just some characteristics to keep in mind. We talk about um, leaf margins. So again, this is the edge of the leaf. Uh, we can have an entire margin where there are no serrations, no sinuses, uh, no incisions. This is just one entire leaf. Um, undulate would be kind of a wavy margin, um, which is a good way to tell uh, an American beach from a European beach. Sinuate uh, would be kind of a, a 2D wavy. We have crenate here, which means kind of a scalloped edge. Dentate would be toothed, 
which if you think about going to the dentist, that makes sense, right? Uh, serrate, um, you've used a serrated knife, so I know most of us can figure out what serrations are. And then cellulite um, would be really, really fine teeth, okay? Really fine serrations. Doubly serrate leaf, you wouldn't think that's very common, but uh, river birch is one of our trees native to Illinois that I would consider the margins of that leaf to be doubly serrate. There are these larger serrations with finer ones in between. Um, how veins are arranged or how they appear on the leaf can be helpful in identification. So we can have parallel venation, um, a netted pinnate leaf, um, a netted palmate leaf. So a pal netted palmate venation might be something like a sweet gum. Uh, they have palmate venation. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. There, we can also have dichotomous uh, venations where the veins extend from one common point and fan out. Something like that would be maybe a ginkgo, uh, ginkgo biloba. Um, and so again, just another characteristic to look at. Oftentimes there's another one um, in our dogwood trees. Oftentimes the veins are arcuate. And so the veins will point toward the leaf tip. Um, just another little identifying uh, characteristic about dogwoods. Then on to leaf surfaces. Um, you know, the surfaces of leaves can really be widely variable. They can be, you know, hairy, pubescent, like we talked about our, our sandpapery hackberry leaves. Um, this swamp white oak or Quercus bicolor um, has a very glabrous or smooth uh, upper surface. So there's no hairs on here. And the uh, underside uh, underneath the leaf is very hairy or pubescent as these little short fine hairs. And so it has kind of two different appearances. What's our description for two? Well, bicolor. And once we do get past the leaves, um, and we should look beyond that a little bit, because again, that's not going to help us in the winter time if we're trying to identify, or if leaves look very, very similar, we have to look beyond that. So buds and stems can be a little more distinctive than leaves. Um, for instance, um, neither of these graphics, but uh, for instance, a horse chestnut has very sticky be uh, buds. Um, sometimes how the bud is oriented on the stem can be an uh, identifying factor. Um, but so here's some of the features on our stem. I've got this nice little diagram here that shows the twig itself. We've got our terminal bud, terminal meaning end. So that's the end of the branch, right? We've got lateral or side buds. Um, these buds are located at a node. And between nodes, we have that's right, the internode. Um, so here is our bud. Now, if a leaf has fallen off or been removed, that leaf leaves a leaf scar, which can vary in shape and size and, and how they are attached. When this terminal bud, uh, they are usually by this time of year, at least where I am, these terminal buds are set. Um, the, there, it's not going to grow anymore. The terminal bud is set. It's preparing, the tree is preparing itself for winter, so to speak. But in spring, all these bud scars are going to, or sorry, bud scales are going to fall away and it's going to continue its growth. Well, those scales will leave little scars. So when that happens, it's going to leave this ring um, that's the terminal bud scale scar. So sometimes on twigs, you can look back a few years in growth, um, which can actually be a, a way to sort of assess the health of a tree over the last few years. If you had six inches of growth one year and now it's only got two inches of growth, maybe that uh, tree has experienced some, uh, you know, maybe drought stress or some other form of stress. So that can be 
uh, a way to assess some tree uh, health. Then also in the leaf scar itself, you'll see the bundle scars. That's where the vascular tissue, the xylem and phloem came through from the stem to the leaf uh, and vice versa. So I've got this actual picture of a black walnut stem. Um, oh, and I didn't, I don't think we have it on here, but the, it does no, note these little spots on here. Those are called lenticels. And those little polka dot lenticels are uh, pores that allow for gas exchange. Um, so whether oxygen or any other gases that uh, need to be let loose or, or absorbed, lenticels uh, are where that can happen. Here's the bud on the black walnut. The leaf scar is this entire green area. And then the bundle scar are these kind of dots in there. Um, so those can look really, really different from one another. Um, some of them, oh, some of them can be really identified by, uh, by those leaf scars. When we are considering the features of buds, we again uh, can look at the size of buds, um, the color and shape, what the surface is like. I mentioned horse chestnut has sometimes a sticky uh, bud. Sometimes on our hickories, they're very hairy or pubescent buds. Um, this is an American beech tree. They're relatively small, but they're long. Uh, they look like little cigars. That's how I kind of thought of them uh, when memorizing things. Um, again, how they are arranged uh, and angled from the stem, um, how it's oriented on the stem, or can be at the end of the stem, as we discussed, the terminal bud, or just below the end of the stem, which would be pseudo-terminal. Um, bud scales are, again, those tissues that are used to protect that, that embryonic tissue, that meristematic tissue at the end of the bud, or in the bud, rather. Um, trees will set bud in the fall. That's where the growth begins again next year. Um, so these bud scales are going to look really, really different on different types of trees. So here we have um, a dogwood bud which is kind of a fat little onion shape. Um, and uh, we would probably call that valvate because there's two parallel scales. There's only two scales to that. Imbricate would be um, our, uh, the beach that we just looked at. Um, and there can be some uh, single scaled where the bud scale covers the entire bud or naked. Uh, where there are no scales, and it's just kind of a leaf-like bud. Um, witch hazel is one like that. Uh, black walnut is also considered a naked or foliose. A single scaled might include something uh, like a sycamore tree. And the reason I'm giving you examples is so you can, you know, take notes now, then go out and, and realize those uh, in real life, so to speak. Again, um, stem features, we look at the color, the thickness, um, the presence of lenticels. These can, again, be helpful in identification. Some twigs are very fine, like I mentioned hackberry. Some are very stout, like hickory. The presence of lenticels um, uh, or the pores on surface uh, can aid in identification. Whether the stem is pubescent uh, and hairy or perhaps waxy, also called glaucous. Um, some have odors. Um, so the tree of heaven is one that comes to mind. If you, this is a very long compound leaf, but if you pull it off where it attaches to the stem, it smells a bit like rancid peanut butter. Um, I'm just letting you know in case you want to go test that out. Uh, the twig of a burning bush um, is have, it has this quirky, quirky growth on it. And in fact, burning bush is euonymus alatus, alatus. Um, and a lot of means winged. So this is often also called a winged euonymus. Um, sometimes the pith or the inner part of the stem um, can be an identifying factor too. For instance, a Kentucky coffee tree has a salmon pink pith. 
Um, this is a black walnut. This is even a dead stem uh, that I picked up off the ground, but they have a chambered pith. You can still even see the little um, chambers in there. Then we sometimes have, uh, now we've looked really up close at trees, sometimes from a distance, things can be noticeable characteristics. Bark can be an incredibly helpful identifying aspect for trees. Again, our American beech hardly have to even look at the leaves at all, even if they are present. It has this smooth, silvery, very, very uh, smooth, like no fissures on it at all bark. Um, the cherry tree, most cherry trees will have these lenticels that are large enough and horizontal that they almost look like stripes in them. Um, and then a sycamore tree is often recognizable by its bark, even if you knew nothing else about it. It has this exfoliating camouflage-like bark um, that gets sort of whitish as you go up the tree. Some things, uh, some trees have distinguishable shapes or colors from afar. So here in the middle, we have a dogwood. Oftentimes, dogwoods have branches that will arch upward, kind of gracefully arch upward at the end. And so that's something that you can notice even from far away. The fall color of sugar maples stand out. Um, our sweet gum uh, often get this pyramidal shape. Um, and you can't beat the fall color of a sweet gum. And if you didn't know either of those things, the fruit of the sweet gum is probably going to clue you into that. Everybody's favorite yard ornament. So just a little practice, would you be able to identify that tree by just, by just the twig? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, some people might be able to, but if I showed you the entire picture, probably a lot more people would be able to identify the flowers on those uh, and as this being a redbud tree. So again, your seasonal differences are gonna make uh, a big difference in your ability to identify. And just to leave you with a few resources, um, I will make sure this is available if it isn't already for, as your uh, handout, but these are some really great uh, tree identification books. They, are, they vary in complexity and ease of use um, and different types of plants referenced. Most you can buy online. These are some uh, good identification websites and apps. We get asked, I, I can't speak for every extension uh, staff person, but I know I get asked a lot, which app is the best to use? We don't really promote one over another. Um, they are all going to vary in accuracy depending on how the photo was taken, uh, what season it is, what parts of the plants were captured in that photo. And again, they can vary in accuracy. So if you're going to use apps, I would recommend using several apps to identify the same thing and see if you get the same answer each time. And then if you need uh, help with confirmation on species identification, certainly I would recommend contacting your local extension office. Not only uh, we staff have the knowledge or resources to assist, but our master gardener and master naturalist volunteers are very knowledgeable on many horticulture related topics, including tree identification. And with that, I'll mention that you can visit uh, and view past recordings of the Four Seasons Gardening series on YouTube by going to the following uh, website uh, address. If you would be so kind, we also ask that you uh, take a moment to complete a survey. Here's a QR code that will take you to it.